Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Jody Bonham. I'm the IT Channel Manager for Eaton in Canada. With me today is my esteemed colleague, Mark, Coll Mark Collins, CEO of F2 Factor, consultant, coach, innovator, and thought leader. On behalf of IT World Canada, we welcome you to the 2023 Channel Innovation Awards. Mark, I'm so glad to be here. How about you? 100%. It's great that in this time of change, and many would say great uncertainty, we still have these constants, these flagship events that you can count on every year for connecting for your inspiration and for your standards to aspire to. Now, before I go any further, I want to make special mention of the four incredible organizations without whose generosity there would be no event today. Let's all give it up, wherever you are, to HP, HP Enterprise, VMware, and Samsung. Thank you to all of you for making today possible. I'd also like to take a moment to mention the Canadian Channel Chiefs Council, or C4. C4 remains the voice of technology channel professionals in Canada. Its membership consisting of IT vendors, solutions providers, and distributors that every day solve major IT business challenges. This event has the full support of this incredible group of leaders who once again this year will be recognizing one worthy organization for their support in the area of diversity and inclusion. Before we get started today, I wanted to take a moment to ensure you all get the most out of today. For those of you tuning in virtually, we're speaking to you from what we call the Jumbotron, the main event viewing screen. I know I don't look like Vanna, I'm doing my best. <laughs> you Immedi awesome. Immediately to the right, which I was told to point this way, <laughs> or below me on some devices, which is that way, you'll find the chat box. And if you have a question that you'd like to see posed to a presenter or a panelist, or if you just want to network with others in the audience, please use the chat box. Why don't you give it a test now by telling us where you are from? That's a pregnant pause. <laughs> you can also explore the CIA TV platform. You'll find a lot of great content, including some great videos and a ton more. To our virtual audience today, we're offering a snack bar sponsored by Samsung. There's Sammy. If you scroll down on your screen, you can either receive an Uber Eats gift card or you can choose to donate it, the gift card to the Food Banks of Canada. And now on with the show. I've been thinking for some time about the theme of this event, evolving the channel ecosystem amid digital transformation. That's quite a mouthful, but the title, the concept, really does get to the heart of one of the key challenges facing organizations today to completely rethink how they go to market. At its core, excuse me, at its core, an ecosystem, at least from a business perspective, uh, is any number of independent parties who together work to innovate around platforms to successfully deliver a series of interconnected outcomes. As, as to why talk of ecosystems is such a thing right now, we can look at the market, which has been shifting largely because of two things. First, it's cloud and consumption. Companies are now consuming tech in, in smaller chunks, installments, as the number of transactions that must be managed and processed has gone right through the roof. Second, we have customers who focus, whose focus has shifted from products or solutions that you folks are offering to the value, the experience, and the overall outcome of the product or solution. So cloud, consumption, customer, the ecosystem model. And so we have a market that is changing rapidly, leaving companies asking, how are we to evolve? How will we adapt? And continue adapting to customer tastes as they too also evolve. The answer is the ecosystem model. We came up with the theme of this year's Channel Innovation Awards, Evolving Ecosystems, for the very simple reason that it's this is an idea 
a concept whose time has finally come. We're going to have an awesome and we're going to have an awesome panel discussion around this very topic. And of course, in keeping with the theme, we'll have many examples today of companies that are doing things differently. With very few exceptions, they prove this idea that no company is an island onto itself. So many of us know the drill for today, but those of you out there who don't, today we'll see four awards for innovation handed out. First of all, the C4 Award for Diversity and Inclusion, going to a channel organization that's been working this hard to solve diversity and inclusion challenges. Secondly, the Cybersecurity Ninja. <laughs> Careful. For an innovation in the form of a new or enhanced security offering that results in increased cybersecurity protection. Third, we have Innovator of the Year. I don't have the dance for that. An initiative for an initiative or solution that helps a partner or client succeed in an extraordinary fashion. And last but not least, Remote Work and Collaborative Workspaces Wonderkind for all innovative initiatives that increased collaboration, communication, and productivity in the workplace. Of course, we'll also be hitting the big list today the much heralded top 100 solution providers ranking. We only have 90 minutes, so rather than list off all the winners, we've created a PowerPoint featuring the top 50 winners. And you can see a ticker running across the top that features 95 of the top 100. So as you can see, folks, it's always exciting to see that top 100 come into focus, and I'm really looking forward to that. Speaking of exciting, we once again this year had a huge number of award nominations come in. This speaks not only to the level of interest out there for this event and these awards and rankings, but also, and this is key, to the sheer number of innovative solutions and players operating in Canada right now, despite all the uncertainty and so-called static going on around the world. Absolutely, Jody. And well, folks, first we have our keynote address. And here to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker for this year, we have Rob Brown, Vice President Channel Sales at HP Canada. Rob, over to you. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Brown, Channel Chief for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Canada. Thank you for your time today and welcome to the 2023 Channel Innovation Awards. Congrats to everyone in the room. You are here for one of two reasons. You are either a perennial contributor to the top 100 or a newcomer who is clearly making an impact. Either way, each and every one of you is clearly a trusted voice in the Canadian channel. Like many of you and your customers, HPE is also transforming. Innovation has always been at our core. Our CEO and visionary, Antonio Neri, told the world just a few short years ago that HPE would make the entire portfolio available as a service by 2022. Well, mission complete. We have gone well past the first adopter phase of this journey with over 10 billion under Greenlight contract for 65,000 customers worldwide through 900 plus partners while managing over an exabyte of data in 60 countries, all while delivering a 96% customer retention rate. As you can see, we have made tremendous progress. We can all see how the world has changed. We live in a consumption-based economy. From the edge to cloud, the way people live, work and play is changing. To help meet that evolution at HPE, we are on a journey to one, one integrated platform one hybrid cloud experience, all delivered under one brand, HPE GreenLake. These are exciting times, and you can count on HPE's 86 plus years of innovation to help you change the way your customers use their data and drive their businesses forward. And now, this year, I'm pleased to say our keynote address will come from none other than Bill Brandel, Senior Vice President and Country Chief Executive at Ingram Micro Canada. This is a man who really needs no introduction in the industry. But for those of you out there who would like to hear more about Bill, let me give it to you in one single word. He's a leader. Bill Brendel is the country chief executive and senior vice president for Ingram Micro Canada. Since becoming a member of Ingram Micro's Canadian operations in 2016, Bill has been a force for change and modernization and has made the right moves to bolster his organization's sales and marketing efforts. Bill's daily focus is on increasing performance, setting new bars, and ever more impressive goals, 
which includes enabling the growth of Ingram Micro's SMB and VAR communities and supporting and maintaining data center technology vendors like HPE. All in, a pretty impressive guy, a natural leader who will no doubt give us a lot to think about around our theme of evolving the Canadian channel ecosystem. Bill, the floor is all yours. Hello everyone. I am really honored to be speaking with all of you around the topic of our ecosystem and really the need to evolve our channel ecosystem. Our channel ecosystem needs to digitally transform. Now, what does that mean, digitally transform? You know, digital platforms are eating our world. From the earliest digital platforms of Amazon and then and the likes of Uber and Airbnb, the platform companies that came into industries that were well established and took a dominant position because of their ease of use, the way part customers could leverage their technology and how they could use the platform with their analytics and with machine learning to drive a really white glove customer experience. That is what I believe our entire ecosystem needs to do from an evolution perspective. So why do we got to evolve? What does this mean? When we think about distribution, so I'll, I'll, I'll stay primarily focused around distribution because it's a space we all play in, right? Uh, as a distributor, I believe it's our job to evolve, to lead the way of evolution. So I believe we should be helping companies on their journey by building a platform on the front end that they can plug into and leverage as they grow and continue to transform their, their organizations. So we have to evolve. Several market forces will challenge the distribution landscape forever. When we think about the as a service, the X as a service, everyone's moving to an as a service model. You know, focusing on the customer experience. And again, I talked about that white glove customer experience. The acceleration of industry consolidation, we see it every day. More and more of our companies, more and more of our partners are, are acquiring each other as the, as the market continu continues to consolidate as we all look for growth. And digital transformation and the creation of pricing and marketplace capabilities is essential if we are going to continue to stay relevant to our customers. The future is about ecosystems. I believe we have one of the strongest ecosystems in all industries, but when we think about where we need to evolve to, by 2025, 75% of all B2B buyers are going to be Amazon-obsessed, digitally-centric millennials. You heard me, it won't be me. In 2025, it's gonna be my children, our children, that are making purchasing decisions for the companies they work for. So if we look at the, the iterations of evolution that we need to go through and where we believe we need to end up, right now we have to move from a very fragmented, kind of uh, limited distribution model and we ultimately have to evolve to a, a, an area where we have marketplaces consolidating into dominant B2B platforms. We need AI-driven technology as the, as the foundation of these platforms. When we look at what we're doing to, to meet the needs of this new digital world, our platform is built on AI and machine learning because I believe it's those functions that will allow platforms to provide the real value, leveraging data, being a data-driven resource so companies can use insights they gain from the data they're given and the AI that's layered on to provide the type of recommendations that companies will need to to focus on for growth, I think that's where we ultimately have to get to as an ecosystem uh, today. And if you think about when we get to that space, the number of players that are going to need to plug in to that ecosystem for this to all work. So the power of ecosystem, I believe, is critical as we continue to move forward and expanding the ecosystem. So look, the third reason is the models changing with everything as a service. I talked about it in the very, very beginning of the presentation around the everything, the X as a service. Future buying patterns will be more subscription driven. 
We're seeing this today. This is nothing new for a lot of us, but I believe that everything will evolve to a subscription in the future. I mean, we've even heard conversations around uh, automobiles being subscription as a service, you know, fully autonomous electric vehicles being able to uh, be subscribed to as a mode of transportation, therefore uh, needing to own a vehicle, running that obsolete. Future buying patterns will be more subscription driven. We are already seeing an explosion of subscription companies evolve, right? When we think about how re recurring revenue drives valuation, the market responds and favors companies with recurring revenue. So even if we have hardware centric manufacturers who've always built a, a foundation on, on hardware, the recurring revenue and subscription driven economies will impact them as well. When we look at how uh, annual uh, growth of companies will be subscription based, it's going to be the number one driver for many companies from now to the future. Uh, as we know, I, I went on just as an aside, I went on today and I had to go into one of my financial institutions and delete a few of the subscription services that I've been paying for, quite honestly, for several months and not using. Who here in this room is guilty of that? I will admit right now, I had to just do that today. So when you think of the power of a subscription and how much revenue can be gener generated as more and more uh, companies are getting uh, linked to these subscriptions and, and they just become you know, part of how, they do, how companies do business, I think it's we are all seeing the value of getting there, right? And marketplace models are on the rise. I talked about the need for a platform. Platform and marketplaces in some situations can be interchangeable. Most marketplaces are built on a platform or being built on a platform for the future because it's truly that platform model where you're truly connected uh, with API integration. Marketplace models are on the rise in B2B. And I think in the future, you'll see B2B to B2C continue as this evolution continues to take place. When we think about the traditional model today, Ingram Micro, for in this example, buys directly from suppliers, sells to resellers, to, the, to their customers, and then they go to their customers. We own the inventory, we work with the suppliers. Right? If you think about a marketplace economy or a marketplace opportunity, now you have vendors listing their products to sell directly to Ingram Micro customers. The vendors manage the inventory flow uh, to a greater degree. And vendors and suppliers together are connected in order to reach the ultimate end user of that technology. When you look at the, the statistics, 550 major B2B marketplaces have exploded in the last 18 months. 70% of enterprise marketplaces will serve B2B in 23. An 18% growth in marketplaces, their year-over-year -year growth is 18%. So if you think about why this is important, you know, our traditional business of growing at two and 3%, if you go to a marketplace and experience 18% year on year growth, that's a far better um, equation for any of us, right? And when we think about the fifth reason about why you gotta make this, this transformation a reality is the consumerization of customer experience. It's needed in distribution, it's needed everywhere. If you just take a look at this chart of the customer experience, the customer journey as it exists, you start to see all of the different ecosystem players that will participate in the journey of one individual customer's purchase, right? Both before the purchase and after. And when you look at the statistics that are out in the market today, B2B buyers spend only 17% of their total purchase journey with sales reps because they're using the technology they have available to them to make their decisions, to do their research, and then they'll start working with a sales associate. In fact, 73% of B2B buyers use digital channels regularly. And 44% of millennials prefer no sales rep in, in, in involvement at all. So again, I think about you know, our kids grew up watching us do what we do, 
and now they're not going to want any part of us, right? I'm kidding. I think the reality is technology is becoming so useful that the need for human interaction is going to is going to be uh, lessened. Now, now for any of you who are in sales, I don't want to. I don't want you worrying. I don't want you to walking away from this conversation thinking that, oh my gosh, what am I going to be doing? The reality is the sales role will evolve. The sales role will be far less around how do we uh, educate partners on our technology, on our products, our speeds, our feeds, and, and where, we, where we're relevant. It's going to be much more consultative and we'll be leveraging the AI and the machine learning from the platforms we build in order to be able to provide a greater level of insight and in fact, a greater level of value to those companies that we do business with. So when you think about why is this important, why should you be doubling down on this ecosystem journey, this digital transformation, it's really around these core areas around giving customers the type of service they want, when they want, how they want, versus delivering them something that we manufacture on our own without really their input. So this just really puts everything and turns it on its head. And the five D's for any platform business to succeed is a lot of what we've been talking about uh, in our time together here. It's to develop and expand the network. When we talk about the network, it's not just the physical infrastructure of network, it's the network of ecosystem players that you partner with. I showed you the type of journey and how it will change, how many different areas people will need to plug in. It's going to in, in require all of us to expand our ecosystem network. When you disintermediate customer account control, that is another great way of saying your platform is going to provide so much value that the customer isn't going to rely on one point of contact within your organization. Think of Uber for a minute. You don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with a, with a driver. You, you log on to the platform wherever you are and the nearest person who has the Uber uh, app, drives for Uber, selects your ride, picks you up and takes you where you have to go. Think about in our world today, if it had to be that one individual who had to do everything, now they better follow you around wherever you go uh, in the world so they can give you that service, right? So when you think about this intermediating the customer account control and truly having your platform drive that, changes the, changes the game dramatically. And again, differentiation through data. We all have a lot of data. We've been in this business for a long time. Leveraging that data and supplying that data in a way that provides true value to customers is going to be a requirement for how we do business. When we think about how AI and machine learning are going to take that data and make it into something very valuable, this is where the future of a platform-driven economy is going to truly accelerate your success. And deploy infinite monetization tools. So if you think about how we've been doing business together in the last 30 plus years of a buy to sell relationship and now with the subscription world and the subscription economy, you have to think about how you're going to help companies finance and provide financial support so they can help their businesses grow as well as their end customers to support them through this transformation, this digital transformational journey. And we have to drive a long-term mindset. We have to take a transaction. We have to remove transactions and make them interactions. When I talk about the sales role changing, today we have a far more transactional relationship when we do business. In the future, those transactions need to turn into interactions where we are interacting with both companies to find the best possible solution for our mutual success. This is where the digital platform business, these are required for the digital platform business to be successful. Transforming to be a platform business requires a huge change in organizational mindset and culture. And again, it's really not just about the technology. Technology is important. Technology needs to work, but it's about a mindset. It's about the people in the organization and the change in mindset that will drive a platform, 
a digital journey. All of the things we've been talking about are in our time together. So think about where you are, who is in your organization and where their mindset is around the need to transform. And then we all have to make the necessary changes to make sure we have the right people with the right mindset to help us with this journey. You know, I'd like to thank you again. As I started out in the beginning, I am extremely honored that I was asked to be able to present on this topic, one that I feel very passionate about, one that I think is important for all of us. And I can tell you Ingram Micro is in this journey. We have deployed our digital platform. Xvantage, it's here. It was launched last year. It's going to continue to evolve. It will be the marketplace of the future for our channel, for our ecosystem. And I hope each and every one of you take time today to explore what we're doing and how we can work together to, to completely transform the Canadian market as a, as a unit. I think it's going to take all of us to get it done. And I believe we can be one of the greatest countries in the world leading the way in technology if we work together. I hope you all have a great event. I wish I was there with you, but I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Have a great day, have a great rest of the event, and take care. Wow. Thanks so much for that, Bill. That was amazing. Uh, I actually uh, snapped a couple of photos of some of those slides. Might be uh, talking to them uh, in future discussions. Thanks, Bill. The CDN top 100 rankings have been around for many years now, 17 to be exact. The ranking continues to be an important barometer in the channel and gives us all great opportunity every year to put the spotlight on top players. All in all, it's a great snapshot of the channel that reinvents itself time and time again, and we're excited to pull back the curtain. Everyone attending this conference will be receiving a copy of the benchmark report. For the virtual audience, you can of course find the rankings of all but the top 10 solution providers in the ticker running across the top of your screen. Here to provide us with an overview of the IT findings is IT executive, entrepreneur, and 2020 Women in IT Hall of Fame inductee, Mary Whittle. Mary specializes in ecosystem development, digital transformation, and how to leverage technology to advance the sustainability agenda. Mary, would you like to take it away? Um, isn't it wonderful to be back together again in person after such a long time of only being able to meet via video? Um, I, I just, uh, I'm so excited to be here. And this is such an uplifting reason to be together is to celebrate the Channel Innovation Awards as well as to announce and recognize the top 100 solution providers for 2023. I'd like to echo the, um, the thanks from all of the other speakers in um, CDN doing the, continuing to do this event. I didn't even know it was 17 years, Jody. that's awesome. And the channel community, community for participating in this insightful research. Um, firstly, to the solution providers who participate, we realize this is not a small time commitment on your part. Um, it is a very comprehensive survey that we ask them to complete. And um, in doing so, they're giving us and you are giving us invaluable insight into what is happening in the client community and sharing your needs to ensure that we as the vendor and distribution communities are able to best support you in serving those customers. This is very important work. So how do congratulations in being included in this most respected community, the top 100 solution providers? As to the vendors and distributors who support this research and celebrate the community, thank you for your ongoing commitment. We truly couldn't do this work without you. So I'm here to share the highlights from the top 20 solution providers benchmark report. Well, let's get started. So 2022 turned out to be a very interesting year. We, what started out with so much optimism and hope quickly turned difficult. 
By the end of the first quarter, even the largest tech companies had started mass layoffs that would endure throughout the year. Tech stocks were plummeting, interest rates were soaring, and fears of inflation and recession began to mount. Um, despite these headwinds, Canada's top solution providers not only persevered, but they prospered. Collective revenues were slightly over $11 billion, posting an impressive 9.5% increase over 2021. So that is really deserves a round of applause, I would say. <laughs> there are some very noteworthy accomplishments described in the benchmark report, and I'm not going to go through them all here, but as a teaser, just as an example, 23% of the top 100 grew more than 25% in 2022. <laughs> and two um, even doubled, more than doubled their business, which when thinking about the top 100 companies, that's a, that's a pretty hefty goal. So I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, in the report, we also delve a little bit deeper into the top 10, and I guess they aren't even shared yet with everybody, but um, of the top 100, and their performance was even more impressive. Um, the combined company's growth averaged 15%. One of the questions we ask is, how do you do best describe your business? And so the IT channel is made up of many different types of companies, as, as you would expect. Um, however, VARs and MSPs make up the vast majority of the 100 top solution providers. 43 companies identified themselves as VARs and 39 as MSPs. 93 are privately held and 7 are publicly traded. And although the VAR community represents 43 of these 100 companies, they deliver the majority of revenue at 74%, and with MSPs falling a considerable distance behind at 18%. Okay, so total number of employees, we, we summarize this still a little bit to um, just, you'll, you'll obviously be able to read it a little better in the report, but um, the category of 51 to 100 employees what, um, declined the most. It declined 23% from last year. And we saw in, in doing, running numbers a little bit more that um, it sort of equally went to smaller size organizations um, and larger ones. While the very large organizations, those greater than 2,500 people, declined by 21% over the prior year. Still, hiring tensions. Oh, I didn't read that slide. Did on mine. Um, so, will your company be hiring in the next 12 months? So, clearly, uh, hiring tensions are still bullish. Uh, 97 expect to hire new people in 2023. And of those hiring, 77% said their expansion will increase more than 6% of current state. So, that's a pretty robust labor market still. Expertise of the increased personnel. So when they're going to look for new people, what is the skill set that they want to attract? Well, similar to last year, it's the um, business and sales, business development and sales positions, um, as well as those with security and cloud skills. This year, we added a new category called solutions marketing, just because we're seeing so much more interest in how to um, how do companies use uh, solutions and, and digital marketing? And um, so it appears that our top solution providers are looking for uh, people with that skill about 30% of the time. So that's, that's uh, for a new category, that's pretty interesting. Okay. So they, uh, another question we ask is, um, what solutions does your company provide to your clients? And you can see the top five responses, IT consulting, managed services, um, and so many things, cloud, <laughs> cloud storage, infrastructure, creating hybrid environment, cloud environments for the clients, and then followed by network infrastructure and data disaster recovery. This is similar, very similar to last year, although uh, more top 100 solution providers spent more time uh, or, um, in providing IT consulting services. And I think we just heard that mentioned that that's going to be something that increases. So clearly this is already happening with our, within our community. So the highest growth potential, um, well, it pretty much mirrors what you would expect um, from based on um, the work that we're doing today. Uh, the 
um, they continue, they expect that will continue to be um, a, a very strong growth area. Um, but the one, the one that topped the list, unfortunately, is security. And so that is not um, an area that we know is going to go away anytime soon. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We expect this to unfortunately be a significant area of growth for the entire industry. Most important areas of specialization or certification. So you can make sure, making sure that you have the credentials within your employee base it, it continues to be a very strong um, value add that the channel community delivers to their clients. And so um, we ask when you're looking for people, what's, what are the certifications and specializations that mean the most to you? And so given the challenges that we will talk a little bit about, but expressed by the top 100, um, the focus of their um, core business and it's not surprising that certifications and specializations of secure, uh, for security top the list and networking and cloud expertise continue to be highly val valuable capabilities of their teams. Okay. Um, percent of revenue from the, um, the, the various sources, so another question we asked. And so, it continues to be the resale of hardware, which is was kind of interesting. It only decreased 1% from last year. And given all the talk we've had even just today about X as a service, you know, everything moving to a, um, a service model, um, it would seem that the clients are still pretty much living in a hardware centric world. Um, and one of the comments made by um, one of the um, participants was that, um, you know, it, this vendor community wanting to move as a service and the customer kind of staying firmly in the hardware world is really starting to create some challenges for how do you manage through these very different environments and it could be a very different environment client to client right so um, i thought that was interesting um and so from the vendor community um I think it's interesting to see to see that soft or X as a service is actually moving slower than we probably all thought it was, or maybe even hoped it would be. Um, there was a there's a category called software built by your firm, so it would be customization, um, potentially APIs that are built, um, and it was the only area we saw a significant decline, weighing in only at nine percent this year, nine percent of the revenue from this um, cohort, and um, versus last year at 21%. So one of the things we ask is, um, of all the things, activities that you took on as a company, what do you think were the biggest contributors to your success? In at almost exactly the same uh, margin, it was uh, believed that the biggest contributors to their success is recurring revenue from annuity models and expanding their offer portfolio, so um, a broader arrangement of, um, of technology services, and then successfully finding new clients. So um, these are the top actions that, uh, that the community felt contributed to their growth last year. Well, the top 100 do business across the gamut of um, sectors, most prominent being professional and business services, um, then the financial, insurance real estate sector, and of course, government. Um, while this is similar to prior years, there was a sizable change in the number of businesses declaring um, certain sectors as primary versus last year. So we asked for a primary and secondary um, rating. So notably, financial services and real estate is now the primary business of 39 companies. Um, I thought that was really quite interesting, uh, an increase of 38% from last year. And government, government has grown to be the primary business of 35 from 29. And um, healthcare was uh, primary for 28 organizations versus um, only 21 last year. So the data shows that most solution providers are still diversifying their business across at least you know, one or two. So only 26% of the respondents suggested that they are getting most of their business from one sector, one industry. 
Um, so the top challenges, this is always an interesting question, and it's a free form question, so people can write as much as they want, and it's, uh, it's really fun to read through them. Um, and this year, no different, uh, very interesting. So uh, of the 100, 35 said that talent, ac all the issues around talent acquisition, um, skill expertise, the skilled training, those were the biggest challenges. Uh, a few things that they mentioned specifically is scarcity of these resources. Um, and then the competitiveness that drives even between the vendor community and between the partner communities themselves in getting that expertise onto their team. And guess what happens as a result of that? Compensation pressures <laughs> increase. So um, this has been obviously particularly different, difficult um, in the economic environment that we're all operating in. So um, that was the number one challenge. Um, supply chain issues, oops, yeah. Supply chain issues, um, which have really, you know, wreaked havoc on the industry over the last couple of years through the pandemic. And then certainly um, things coming from China being very difficult to get our hands on on a regular basis. So that continues to be an issue. And then equally concerning were the, um, the economic issues that their clients were either freezing or decreasing budgets. Um, and, when, and oftentimes supply chain could even contribute to that because if you couldn't get the product on time, <laughs> then the um, client would say, okay, well, I've got other projects that I'm gonna fund before I lose my budget. So it really became quite an exciting um, <laughs> role just trying to figure out how do we make this, make this all happen. So not surprising that those two were equally um, difficult. And then of course, cybersecurity, right? Uh, cybersecurity is on the increase. Um, and the other thing that's uh, really important to this community is there are so many new solutions coming out and they need to be right. There's so many different, <laughs> they're bad actors. Sophistication is, is, um, a very real issue. So they need to look at a very wide variety of solutions and they need to vet them all. And that is a very time consuming exercise for the, um, the partner community. So it's just a, you know, it's just one of the things that, um, you know, we hope we can get our hands around a little bit better. And the more we can do as a community and ecosystem to support each other in, um, you know, getting these solutions for our, our clients and ourselves even, um, the better off we'll be. Okay, so another um, uh, question we asked, this is a new one this year actually, but we hear from the vendor community increasingly that they are they would like our channel community to work with the clients and to make sure that we're managing as a community the entire channel or the life cycle of the customer for that vendor's product so that's not to say that um, every channel partner is expected to do every step of the journey and we're certainly seeing um specializations happen around um, you know the introduction of technology the implementation of technology but then on an ongoing basis maybe not so much um, they want to do be responsible for the renewals or the ongoing you know um, uh, service levels so um, we're seeing people um, differentiate did I move no. yes I did. okay um, seeing uh, people differentiate what they're going to bring to the table and partnering with other organizations to make sure that the entire journey is is covered. Um, I was very surprised to see this distribution being so even. Um, I think that would should be very comforting to the vendor community um, because um, all the areas that are critical to you um, are are being well covered by this by this group, and then the um, the one thing being renewal and support and ongoing maintenance, not surprising that that's the biggest um, expenditure of time. Okay, so um, this year we, we probed on a few different subjects in an attempt to capture you know, the, the engagement um, activities and um, 
and techno and we looked at technology topics that CDN was increasingly having people talk to them about, right? So a couple, we're, we won't go through all of them, but um, a couple of them were customer lifecycle management. That's something that we had heard quite a bit about. And then the other one was sustainability. And we're seeing a huge um, interest coming from the client community, coming from the vendor community. Um, I think most of you working with vendors know that the larger vendors are having sustainability and climate initiatives for in, within their um, their new partner programs. So um, we have a little. Um, Paul wrote a, a a bit of an article just to give a little bit more flavor on that and hear or for ha allow you to hear what we're seeing. And so thank you, Paul. I think that's really great. But are we also hearing our customers saying we need our channel community to start to help us with the scope one, two, three emissions. How do we capture our data and be able to, you know, report? Most of them aren't, you know, necessarily needing to report to SEC or TSX, but they wanna they want to um, have that information. So if they, you know, if they need it, plus they also want it to to run a sustainable net zero journey themselves. So um, we're gonna, I think as an industry, we're gonna need to really work together to help um, each other and our companies, our, our client companies, um, get through this really this um, deluge of reporting requirements and um, sustainability issues. So um, to make sure that you take a look at that. So I'm going to um, just say thank you once again to all of the solution providers for participating in this report. Um, I think you'll find some very interesting information there, and um, it, and it's important insight that our vendor community and distribution community um, look at and really try to gauge the activities that they'll do. So I'd just like to say congratulations, one and all. Mary, thank you so much for that report and uh, the insights in there. Very valuable information, would you agree? Yes. All right. Up next, we have a riveting panel discussion between Mark Collins and Mr. Fred Patterson, the uh, Canadian ecosystem leader for Red Hat Canada. Mark and Fred will be discussing the evolution of ecosystems in the channel. Hosting the panel is our friend Rob Brown of HPE. So let's take a look. Hi, my name is Rob Brown, Channel Chief for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Canada, and welcome to the 2023 Channel Innovation Awards. It's our pleasure to spend some time with you guys today. Joining me are two of my peers, who I will ask to introduce themselves in just a moment, to chat about the future of distribution channels in an evolving channel partner ecosystem. Positioning ourselves to add value for our customers is a common goal. So today, we will explore this partner ecosystem, some of the barriers and benefits to leveraging it, and how we can all gain the most from it. So let's get started by introducing our panel. Mark, I thought I'd start with you. Hi, Rob, it's good to see you. And uh, thanks so much for inviting me to this conversation today. It's good to see you as well, Fred. Looking forward to hearing from you in a second. And uh, I'm the CEO of F2 Factor, Rob. Our mission is to help companies unlock their keys to growth. So we work with companies and helping them develop their strategy all the way through to executing their strategies so they can drive unprecedented growth in their business. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Hi, Fred, over to you. Hey, Rob, uh, hope you're well. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I look forward to the conversation. I'm the channel chief here at Red Hat in Canada, and it's Red Hat's mission uh, you know, to um, uh, help the customer migrate, modernize, and automate their data center and their applications as they move to the cloud. Good stuff. Well, hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Uh, let's start by uh, defining the differences between a channel and a ecosystem of partners. Uh, Mark, maybe we can start with you. Just really just uh, define the differences between the two. Sure, well, Rob, I guess the best way I could tackle this question would be, be to say, I, I think it starts with the customer. And what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve with the customer? We've all been chasing that that title of trusted advisor for the customer or solutions provider. 
And the reality is, whether it be inside your own organization or working with organizations around you, I think there's a difference between capturing a transaction versus ultimately solving a problem. And I think that that status of trusted advisor and the stickiness companies are chasing comes with solving problems. So if you want to solve a problem, the first thing you're going to need to understand is what is the problem? And the reality is the high tech industry, it's a complex business and there's nobody that can solve a problem alone and no individual product or piece of software that solves a problem alone. So ecosystems are ultimately about taking yourself as a channel, offer the value that you can offer, but making sure that you surround yourself with all the other contributors to solve the problem. Some of it you'll monetize, some of it you won't. But if you're the one that actually leads that path to the customer, bringing it together, that ecosystem surrounding you will make you the trusted advisor of the customer. That's been my experience. Agreed. What do you think, Fred? Yeah, I think um, I agree wholeheartedly. When I refer to you know the channel today, the term ecosystem does prevail in my thinking. In that, at least in our business, I know uh, you know we are finding that more often than not, there are multiple partners involved in that journey, and it's up to us all as ecosystem partners to ensure we can work together to satisfy that customer's needs, no matter where they are in that journey. Yeah, great. No, great two explanations from both of you guys. I think the one thing that jumps out to me when I think about this question is skill set. We all have a different skill set, right? Customers are really looking to many of the the partners in the room to be a single point of entry to their solutions and and, and delivery against those solutions and the services that go along with it. And they may or may not have the full suite of skill sets um, and, and services to deliver, but they can pull in their ecosystem of channel partners to help uh, aggregate um, those uh, services and solutions to drive uh, one point of entry into the customer. I think, Rob, too, just just to jump in, because um, I think Fred said something really important, and I completely agree with the way you just brought it back together, Rob. And ultimately, if we, if we look at when we were growing up and going to school, we all heard about ecosystems probably more in geography class or something like that, learning about forestry or learning about nature. And the one thing that we learned along the way, and we hear about it more and more these days, as we hear about you know global warming and how everything is connected, just like you were just saying, ultimately, the customer needs the ecosystem in order not just to thrive, but also just to survive. So, I mean, understanding that the ecosystem, first of all, acknowledging that it exists understanding the role that you play in it and understanding how dependent that customer is on that ecosystem to actually interact and work together to the point you were making, Rob, that is absolutely critical. Yeah, very true. Um, And now now that we've defined um, what that ecosystem is that we're talking about, um, the differences inside, um, let's talk about some of the benefits. Um, There's some benefits and there's some barriers to it. Let's let's address both. But maybe, Fred, we'll start with you. What do you see as some of the the benefits? Um, So, Customer success comes to mind as a key advantage, whereas if a single entity within that ecosystem was trying to do it, you know, they may not have the skills, expertise, people, you know, to be able to, you know, work alongside their customer, you know, throughout that journey. Um, The second one is scale. Uh, You know, I think that this is not just about reaching new customers. It's about, uh, you know, reaching um, more uh, within that organization. Uh, you know, there are different motivations within each customer, you know, have procurement who want to, you know, drive down the cost of acquisition uh, and, um, you know, ensure the best deal for, you know, the organization. But on the other hand, there's also IT, there's security, there's the C office, which also have different, um, uh, you know, goals uh, and problems that they're trying to solve. So working with an ecosystem can, by proxy, create greater scale for you, the ecosystem player. And when I say the ecosystem player, I mean, it's a vendor, it's a, it's a selling partner, it's a service provider. Uh, we are, we are all play equal but different roles in this ecosystem. Furthermore, I think insight, um, it's very difficult getting back to no one entity can, uh, you know, really address all the problems or concerns of customers. When you work with a, a coalition of partners around solving a problem, you gain insights you might not otherwise about, you know, where that customer is at in their journey and what can be done to drive, um, you know, toward their goals. And then finally, um, co-creation is, is another big one. And I'm referring to offerings or services that might not have otherwise existed without a group of partners working together. And, uh, you know, a platform company, you know, such as uh, Red Hat, 
many of our ecosystem players are building solutions upon ours that, again, without one or the other player might not exist, which therefore couldn't help solve the problem of customer. Yeah, good stuff for sure. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? If you look at this sort of roller coaster ride we've been through in the past two or three years, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, ultimately, while maybe only a few of our customers are in high tech, the reality is all of our customers are becoming technology companies now because we've had no choice. And in the journey to become technology companies along the way, the reality is I don't think hardly any of the executives among our, our customers, you know, think about tech in terms of the business that they're in. They could be anything from, you know, farming to forestry to, to retail to manufacturing. They're all thinking about three things. How do I raise revenues? How do I contain my costs? And how do I reduce my risks? Right. And when you look at those three forces of business and you're looking at this notion of, of, of benefits, ultimately, the organization that assembles the ecosystem that's aware of these three forces and can, can connect the impact of the technology on the priority of those leaders and those executives trying to get at those three effects, those three outcomes, they're the ones creating the greatest value. And by impacting those three metrics, they're unlo unlocking or unleashing the benefits of that ecosystem. And that actually ties into what I wanted to add on, and that's the pace of change. I mean, this industry, we all know how fast it evolves. I mean, we've all been around for a while now and seen it evolve you know, a dozen times over. And here we are going through it again. And as you go through that pace of change, maybe the, the conversation now shifts to some of the barriers. Uh, pace of change is a barrier. Uh, talent acquisition is a barrier. Yeah. Um, customers, uh, partners, sorry, can't, uh, it's hard for them to do it all, uh, to be experts at it all. I mean, they try, many of them are, <clears throat> excuse me, some of them have uh, core deep skill sets uh, and they need to acquire those other skill sets through that ecosystem of channel partners. But either one of you jump in if you like, but what, what would you say on the opposite side of that question, some of the barriers um, to, to a partner ecosystem and the, the constant evolution that we're all going through? I think there's inertia, um, firstly. Um, I, I think that there has been, um, a, a question of how to optimize engagement with a partner, um, let alone multiple partners. So I think that, um, you know, every organization within that ecosystem, you know, really needs to understand what the value is, uh, where they fit within that customer journey, and then to identify those entities in the ecosystem around them that can complement and, and expand the value add that that group brings. And that takes time, that takes energy, and oftentimes you're dealing with some ambiguities. You may be dealing with co-opetition uh, and so forth. But, you know, it comes down to understanding, um, you know, their, the roles and responsibilities of each of those players and, uh, you know, making sure that you're minimizing conflict and keeping the customer's issues and problems in mind. Mark, maybe we can pivot over to you um, and talk about the mind shift that's required. Our channel partners that are constantly going through this, uh, this evolution of change that we spoke about. What mind shift is required at this stage in the journey? As the industry has expanded, more and more technology has gotten out there. Customers' environments have gotten more complex. They've become more dependent on them. But their needs on their side to drive greater value, greater impact for their customers means that they need to be able to rely on companies that aren't just providing that individual um, piece of the puzzle, but that ecosystem solution. And so accepting the fact that you're not going to make your numbers or build your company or hit your success plan just banking on organic expansion, but going deeper and deeper into both solving problems, but helping customers see and capture opportunities. That's a completely different mindset. It means le leading with a business skill set. It means understanding the connections between business and technology. And it means sometimes success comes from capturing savings and lowering risk. It won't always come from just capturing expansion or chasing the up to the right curve all the time. Yeah, it's a different way of doing business. And um, the, the people that our partners are talking to at the customer are changing as well. We've talked about business outcomes here a lot today. I can tell you, frankly, from, H, from an HPE uh, vantage point, uh, we're, we're becoming, a, uh, we're transforming to a cloud services organization. We're trying to capture this consumption-based economy mm -hmm. that is hitting us like a wave. Uh, and in doing so, our sales force is being asked to knock on new doors. Right. It's not just the IT door anymore. It hasn't been that way for a while. It's the CFO. It's the CIO, the CTO, CT, CEO on some occasions, depending on the size of the company, because they're looking to uh, ex, um, extract value from their data. They're not just looking to store it. 
They want to pull value from it. And uh, the talent acquisition that we talked about previously is challenging even at the sales level because those that have been selling IT for years um, um, are, are the right skill set, but they also have to transform their conversation to the, to the C-suite and talk to those people in a different way. And, and Rob, to that point, j- just to, to do my best to tie it off, I think you raise a very, very critical issue when you talk about barriers and challenges to change. It's not just for vendors and partners, it's also for customers. And you use the term extract value. And you yourself with, with HP and the work that you're doing to move to more OPEX models and consumption models, the reality is why you're doing that. You're doing it to enable your customers to be able to become less dependent on skills inside their company that look like operators and shift their investment and skills and, and shift their abilities more to people that can see insights, apply data, use it to help them fuel their business and differentiate themselves versus sitting on a technology stack that they really don't know how they can use it to make their company stronger. So the customers actually have challenges in terms of evolving and getting the right talent mix and finding that talent themselves to make maximum use of technology. How do all sides win in this conversation? Fred, any thoughts? The first thing that I often rely upon is understanding the you know, the partners, for lack of a better word, whether it's another ISV, whether it's a hyperscaler, whether it's a, a, a traditional partner, understanding, um, you know, the core of their business, you know, what is, where do they play? Who are their customers uh, within the customer name? And how they win is not just at the top level, but right down to the rep level, because I think we all know um, a lot of, you know, good connections within the ecosystem to happen at the street. Um, so we have to make sure we understand, you know, how we all win. Uh, together. Uh, I think you also need to, you know, select, select clear goals. You know, what are we trying to achieve with this customer? How are we going to work together? You know, what are the metrics of success and how are we going to revisit those, you know, throughout this period and beyond? And then I think also, you know, again, because oftentimes there could be this notion of competition or coopetition again, make sure those th- sorts of um, uh, elements are uncovered early and make sure we understand how we're going to work through those. Agreed. Mark, any thoughts on, on how all sides in the equation uh, can win in this model? Yeah, and I might be repeating a little bit about what Fred said, but I mean, here, here at F2 Factor, we, we focus on this a lot, and I'd really boil it down to three things, Rob. One is we talked about customer outcomes, putting the customer at the center of the entire conversation, because the reality is if it's not about the customer and understanding the outcome, then you're probably not going down the right path and you're probably not going to be successful. Number two is lead with listening. It's so important that in that room, when that ecosystem starts to form, that they see you leading with listening because if you're doing all the talking, they're seeing your behavior and they're seeing you're not playing a win-win-win game. You're focusing on yourself. So customer at the center of the conversation, lead with listening, And I would say that the last piece that's so critical is about being transparent, right? Be upfront about what it is you expect of the ecosystem, what you depend on from the ecosystem and what you bring to the ecosystem and ask the same of them. Um, I often remind my team to your point, Mark, that uh, we're not trying to sell a customer something. We're, We're trying to solve a problem or we're trying to create an opportunity for them, one or the other. The solution will take care of itself from that vantage point. And um, uh, you bring a lot more to the table. You expand your opportunities. As a sales guy, as a mom, I'm thinking to myself, where's my next opportunity come from? Well, by opening up um, um, my skill set by partnering intelligently could potentially open up new verticals, new solutions that I haven't been successful in previously and so on. So um, really focusing on that end customer outcome, I think is critical uh, to how we move forward. The next question we got down here is simple. Why now? Um, why is this so, such an important conversation and a relevant conversation today. Fred or Mark, uh, either one of you guys, please chime in. What, what do you guys think why this is an important conversation today? Do you want me to get in front of this one, Fred, and then I'll hand it over to you? Yeah, sure. Um, Rob, I would say why now? I would say because data is king. I think we're in a data race right now. I think that there's a huge opportunity because we know more and more about our customers and our ecosystem partners than we ever did before. But those who can apply it the fastest, derive value from it, will pull ahead and make a huge difference. The economy right now is in an odd place with rising interest rates and slowdowns. There's an old saying that says it's during downturns is the time to pull away. That's now. 
those who can get their arms around that data and apply it will break away during this time of downturn and really come out the other side, really being differentiated and really outpacing their competition. So I think it's a great opportunity, but it requires vision and an understanding of how to get your arms around that data. Um, one thing I'll add, um, you, you really did nail it. You know, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about how do you provide compute um, storage uh, backup services to a customer. Then it evolved to this cloud operating model. The, cust- the way customers experience their IT changed with that cloud operation model and uh, inserting itself predominantly in the channel, you know, three to, f- three to five years ago. Um, and to your point now, um, and this is the point I wanted to make that uh, to, to reinforce yours, is that the, the data center used to be a cost center. Now it's a profit center, and we need to treat it like one. Um, and the customers that haven't realized that yet, it's an opportunity for this um, ecosystem of partners to provide not, not only um, solutions, but consulting to get on that path to derive more value from their data instead of just struggling to store it. Uh, Fred, do you have any thoughts um, as to why now? So I, I, I couldn't agree more with what both of you said. I think what I'd add to it is uh, why now is because regardless of the motion a partner takes, it is moving forward today. It has been moving forward for the past while. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, customers are making big bets in the cloud. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have spent millions on, on uh, you know, cloud contracts as an example, you know, to migrate uh, applications from the traditional data center to the cloud. And they're looking to optimize those investments. Uh, I also think that engaging with, you know, a broad set of partner types, the ones that I'm finding most successful have already started this journey some time ago. And it takes time. I mentioned this before, building a coalition, building these relationships take time. And if you don't start now, or hopefully if you didn't start six months ago or a year ago, it's going to take you time to, you know, really drive that value and uh, um, uh, be realized by the customer. Yeah, agreed. And the, the one thing I would I would add just to wrap it up is as to why now is the, the back to this pace of change. I've been in this channel for 25 years and there's um, partners in the ecosystem I've never heard of before that are just popping up all over the place. Uh, some of them are only a couple of years old. Uh, the, the amount of uh, um, skill set, talent and organizations that have entered our ecosystem in the past five years has been astronomical. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, they're all addressing a market. They're all addressing an opportunity. They're all addressing, uh, addressing a shift. And it's our responsibility as a channel to understand what they are. Uh, leverage them so that we can scale our offerings to the market. So if you wonder why you need to make this shift, you simply take a look at the type of organizations that are entering our channel ecosystem, and you'll realize that this world is changing fast. And you got to be a part of it. Good stuff. Well, hey, guys, um, I think that's a great place uh, to wrap it up. I think we're on time. Um, so I just want to thank you guys, both Fred and Mark, for, for joining us today and providing your insights. It's been a lot of fun. I wanted to thank our friends at ITWC for providing this platform for us to have a great conversation and to help our Canadian channel thrive. Um, So it's been a pleasure of mine to spend some time with you guys today. I congratulate everybody in the room once again for for all of your accomplishments this year. Um, And I look forward to talking to all of you guys soon. So have a great day. Cheers, everybody. Thank you all. Be well. Wow, well said. Fred, Mark, and Rob, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was an excellent panel. Thank you very much. Let's uh, now take a little bit of a breather for those of you uh, in our live audience. Uh, it's a great time to stretch your legs, check the email. Do you remember the restrooms are over here? Stage left. <laughs> uh, or you can grab a refreshment. I think there's something happening on the terrace out there. Uh, for those of you joining us virtually, are you ready for one of our famous quizzes? Take a look at this quick run through of how it's going to work. We'll be back in 10. Here we go. Question number one. What percentage of solution providers said the growth potential of IT security would increase or increase significantly over the next 12 months? Would it be A, 65%, B, 78%, C, 82%, or D, 93%? Enter your answers now. The correct answer is D, 93%. The global cybersecurity market is projected to grow $376 billion 
by 2029 at a CAGR of 13%. Question two, what percentage of solution providers say they will be hiring next year? Is it A, 25%, B, 50%, C, 75%, or D, 97%? The correct answer is D, 97%. According to Robert Half, demand for contract workers is increasing. Key areas are software development, cloud architectures, and technology process automation. You folks are doing great. Here's question number three. How much of HP's business globally is driven through the channel? A less than 10%, B, 35%, C, over 85%, or D, 57%. Let's get everybody's answers in. The correct answer is C, over 85%. A key quote from HP CEO Enrique Lores channel is at the core of how we build and design our plans. So there you have it. Moving on to question number four. Which vertical is served by the most solution providers? Is it A, aerospace, B, retail or wholesale, C, professional and business services, or D, food and beverage? That's an interesting one. The correct answer is C, professional and business services. And two of the greatest areas that will affect professional and business services are hybrid offices and the introduction of artificial intelligence. While there's a great deal of attention on AI and deservedly so, the biggest immediate opportunity will be making the hybrid meeting a great experience. There are 90 million conference rooms worldwide and only 10 million of them are basically equipped for hybrid virtual meetings. A great opportunity for the channel. Final question here, folks. So get your fingers working. Here we go. Question five, which of the following is considered the least important certification by solution providers? Is it A, networking, B, certified ethical hacker, C, cloud, and D, security? The answers are coming in. And the correct answer is B, Certified Ethical Hacker. The Certified Ethical Hacker credential is the most trusted ethical hacking certification that employers worldwide value. Who knew? Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you all had a bit of fun and learned a thing or two. Now, let's jump back over to the live event. Okay, we are going to start back at it. So hopefully everybody has a drink. And we're going to take a vote now. Who thinks that was the best looking panel in the history of IT? <laughs> I'm feeling the same way. And if you look around very carefully, you might spot some familiar faces. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, so welcome back everyone. And now for the, uh, for the awards. For those of you who are new to this conference and curious as to how we determine the Channel Innovation Award winners, when we get so many nominations, there is no magic to speak of. However, let me say we have an official judging panel, the members of whom tackled a rather tall stack of uh, nominations, which came in from across all of Canada. As you can imagine, the task of determining a single winner when so many companies deserve recognition is not easy. And there were some hair splitting going on. I don't think they were looking at me when they said that. 
And in the end, though, the judging panel made its decisions, and you'll find out very shortly who won what award. On behalf of IT World Canada and anyone else who was involved in the judging process, a huge thank you. Thank you for giving your time. Of course, thanks to also goes to the various organizations who took the time to share their stories with us. In our book, you're all winners. But alas, as there is no participation awards to hand out, there will only be one winner per category. For the winners, once your award has been announced, we invite you to join us on stage to collect your award and take a quick photo. Thank you to you all. And here to present the C4 Diversity and Inclusion Award is my fellow C4 board member, Sandy Delzotto from Samsung. Thanks, Jody and Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandy Delzato, Channel Marketing Manager at Samsung Electronics Canada. It's certainly great to, to be here and, and uh, in front of all of you, and I'm grateful to be presenting on behalf of C4 Association, the C4 Diversity and Inclusion Award. While the award is fairly new, it comes out of the most encouraging trend in companies towards putting time and energy into equity diversity, and inclusion. The mission of C4 is to become the voice of the Canadian Technology Channel, and ensuring diversity and inclusion is included in that voice. Annual events supported by CDN and C4, such as the Women in the IT Channel, is just one example that uh, recognizes women, uh, the contribution, sorry, of women in the channel. While we look forward to making change and continuing the conversation, we look now to celebrate the winner of this year's award. The C4 Diversity and Inclusion Award goes to CDW. CDW's business diversity program goals are to increase procurement opportunities for direct and indirect spending with small, minority-owned, women-owned, veteran-owned, disabled-owned, and other small disadvantaged businesses. The CDW philosophy on diversity extends well beyond co-workers, customers, and communities to include supplier partnerships. CDW's commitment to strategically partner with qualified businesses enables this organization to continue to provide the very best possible customer experience while contributing to economic growth in diverse communities. CDW launched its business diversity program in 2007 and has seen considerable increases in diverse spending since the program's inception. Since 2007, CDW has spent $20 billion with certified diverse suppliers. Congratulations to CDW, winner of the 2023 C4 Diversity and Inclusion Award. Congratulations again. And here to present the Cybersecurity Ninja Award for the innovation in the form of a new or enhanced security offering that results in increased cybersecurity protection for their clients is Rob Brown from HPE. Thank you, Jody. The importance of the next award cannot be overstated. The rapidly emerging digital ecosystem is now super treacherous particularly for those companies that continue to play by old rules and old assumptions. In the current digital environment, it's really now open season on any organization, regardless of age or industry. Virtually every company going today is in some way vulnerable. There is, to be certain, no such thing as invincibility, not when bad actors are evolving with such rapidity. It's never easy to single out one company for their work in the area of cybersecurity when there are so many strong players in that space. But I think you'll all agree this organization has earned this year's Cybersecurity Ninja Award. The winner of this year's Cybersecurity Ninja Award goes to Decisive Group. Decisive Group's Defensive Cyber Operations Team has taken managed SIEM beyond outsourced management and monitoring of a tool set. This ensures the analysis of discovered incidents happens faster and with great consistency to drive outcomes that matter most to clients. 
To accomplish this, their defensive cyber operations team uses a combination of best-in-class security information and event management, threat intelligence, and security orchestration and automated response. The way Decisive's DCO personnel use these technologies drives home the concept of next-gen, because active security monitoring is only as good as how you do it. Congratulations to Decisive Group, winner of this year's Cybersecurity Ninja Award. So I don't believe uh, Decisive are here, but huge congratulations to them. And should they fail to be able to complete the exercise of being the winner of this award, it's not true. Um, here to present the Innovator Year of the War for an innovative solution to help, that helped a partner or client succeed in extraordinary fashion is Channel Daily News editor Paul Barker. Paul, the stage is yours. Uh, coming up with the recipient of this award, Innovator of the Year, is tough, as there are so many organizations deserving of such extra mention. Oftentimes, such an exercise comes down to whether the impact of an innovation goes beyond a specific group, for example, a client and its clients and partners. This year's Innovator of the Year was given to an organization whose work is special meaning or impact at a time when healthcare and well-being is so front of mind for people. Uh, this very special and very well-respected organization dedicates its considerable expertise and sense of what works to, to the improvement of all our communities. The company does this by working with and for healthcare organizations to support them in their digital transformation to help orchestrate the continuum of care. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my organization and of the organizers of this fine event, I give you Pedal Health, the very deserving winner of this year's Innovator of the Year Award. Pedal Health's orchestrator platform is an ecosystem of data-driven cloud-based solutions that allows healthcare organizations to orchestrate patient care delivery workflows with an accurate view of medical workforce and patient demand. The platform offers patient self-scheduling, true real-time patient self-scheduling capable of serving millions of patients and supporting thousands of concurrent systems. The platform allows for physical scheduling, the creation of position schedules based on personalized rules and preferences, easy shift swaps, and integrated communication. There is care coordination, featuring advanced prioritization logic based on clinical capacity and patient demand. The platform offers secure communication, a secure system designed specifically for healthcare delivery organizations. Perhaps most importantly in this age of organizations having to do more with less, Petal's orchestrator platform offers capacity management and centrally connected data and allows physicians and staff to access assignments in real time. Congratulations to Petal Health, the 2023 Innovator of the Year. Congratulations, Petal Health. You've earned every bit of that award. Here to present the Remote Work and Collaborative Workspaces Wonderkind Award for innovative initiatives that increased collaboration, communication, and productivity in the workplace is our friend Simon Powell, Director, Partner Organization from VMware. Thank you, Jody, and hello, everyone. I'm Simon Powell, and I have the pleasure of leading VMware's Canadian Partner Organization. I'm with you today to introduce the winner of this year's Remote Work and Collaborative Workspaces Wunderkin Award. Even as the global health crisis wanes, companies around the world are working to complete their transition into the so-called new world of work, which includes and will likely continue to include some form of remote work. Study after study, survey after survey has told us that employees wish to continue working remotely at least part of the time. For employers who hurriedly cobbled together their hybrid office in 2020, there are many rough edges yet to smooth out if hybrid is to become a permanent thing. The winner of this year's remote work 
and Collaborative Workspaces Wunderkin Award is Annex Pro. They didn't just slap up any old solution. What Annex Pro came up with, well, let's just say it was very special and, of course, highly effective. Let's take a look, shall we? By any standards, the project was colossal. An on-location reality show, a cast of 14, 25 cameras shooting 24-7, 2,500 hours of footage, a large distributed team, and only four weeks to ramp up a post-production process to begin as soon as filming wrapped. All-Star Shore, a Viacom production for Paramount Plus, turned to Eggplant Picture and Sound based in Toronto, a boutique post-production house, who in turn contacted their media production specialized solution provider, NX Pro. It was quickly realized that creating an on-premises studio data center was not realistic. Eggplant producers needed a collaborative workflow for the 26-member team of editors, story leaders, and executives located in diverse geographic locations. Ultimately, NX Pro and Eggplant decided to implement a relatively new cloud video editing solution called Abbott Edit On Demand. The innovative solution offered multiple advantages compared to on-prem, including speed, ease of use, security, and a SaaS on-demand option to scale up and down as needed. Working with NX Pro, Eggplant was able to quickly create a custom Avid Edit On Demand workflow. The footage was processed into DNX45 proxy, then uploaded to the cloud, allowing assistants to begin sync mapping by laying out the day's footage. Eggplant plans to incorporate the collaborative workflow in upcoming projects. Congratulations to NX Pro for winning this year's Remote Work and Collaborative Workspaces Wunderkind Award. Well, thank you, Simon. I now know how to pronounce Wunderkind instead of Wonderkind. How about that? Thank you. Congratulations, Annex Pro. Offer your congratulations to our winners in the chat or better yet on Twitter using hashtag CIA Awards. All right, up next, we have IT World Canada's President and Chief Revenue Officer, Ray Christofferson, who will take us through this year's top providers, numbers 10 through six. Thank you, Jody. Have you found your company's spot on the top 100 solution providers ranking yet? Have you followed the ticker along the bottom of the screen and checked out where you stand and where the competition sits? In order to make the ranking, you had to complete the top 100 survey by the deadline and have over 5 million in Canadian revenue for 2022. If you're still not seeing your name, it might in fact be a good thing. It might mean your organization made the top 10, in which case we'll be announcing your ranking shortly. Our number 10 ranked solution provider is headquartered in Burnaby, BC, with its offices in Victoria, Calgary, Edmonton, and Halifax. Founded in 1987, this organization supports the IT needs of businesses and organizations of industries from the Pacific to the Atlantic, with clients ranging from mid-size operations to enterprise-level organizations. This company's been on something of a roll in the past number of years, and last year was awarded a spot on the Business in Vancouver list of top 100 fastest growing companies. Between 2017 and 2021, this organization's revenue grew by an impressive 46.6%. Later that year, the company took the Dell Technologies Canadian Partner Award 2022 for client solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an organization that is on its way up. And it's our distinct pleasure to recognize Microserve as our number 10 ranked solution provider. Next up, we have our number nine ranked solution provider, an organization that provides technology services and solutions ranging from strategic IT consultancy to solutions implementation. This includes procurement and management of IT infrastructure and organizations, either in partnership with your staff or outsourced using consultants. This organization makes a point of trying to go beyond just selling products. Their focus is on coming up with solutions that will help its clients move past certain challenges and level up. 
If there's a secret sauce to this company's success, it's listening, getting a firm grasp on clients' challenges, and coming up with tailor-made solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, our number nine ranked solution provider for 2023 is ITI. Moving right along to the occupant of our number eight spot, we have a services-led, software-enabled, IT and cloud solutions provider focused on delivering industry-leading solutions. This company's global approach delivers advanced analytics, application modernization, cloud platforms, cybersecurity, digital infrastructure, and digital workplace offerings to clients across various industries. Our number eight ranked solution provider recently earned a place on the 2023 Tech Elite 250 list of CRN, a brand of the channel company. This is an organization very much on the upward swing, having recently enjoyed a record Q4 and fiscal 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, let's celebrate the success of Converge Technology Solutions. Next up in the number seven spot, we have one of the more dynamic IT solutions and services companies in North America. This organization combines business and technology through its hybrid IT solutions, including cloud, IT infrastructure, managed services, and end user support. The organization was recently recognized by Microsoft's newly launched Solutions Partner Program with six designations across their solution areas, data and AI, digital and app innovation, infrastructure, modern work, security, and business applications. Our number seven ranked solution provider is focused on bringing agility, simplicity, and insight to client organizations, clarity in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our very great pleasure to announce that Longview Systems is number seven on this year's top 100 solution providers list. Well, that leaves me with one final ranking to announce, number six. It's hard to define this organization, which has been a steady presence on the big list over the years, other than to use the word depth. More than 9 million devices supported globally, more than 8 million contacts handled each year, 85% first contact resolution, more than 7,000 talented associates, more than 70,000 technical certifications, and more than 300 enterprise managed services clients. Check out some of its kudos from the last number of months. Named one of the Elite 150 on CRN's managed service provider 500 list. Named a leader in the Spark Matrix in digital workplace services report created by Quadrant Knowledge Solutions. Recognized as a disruptor in Avisant's Digital Workplace Services 2022 Radar View for the second consecutive year. Recognized as a major contender in Everest Group's Digital Workplace Services Peak Matrix Assessment 2022. Folks, this organization means business. And we are pleased once again to announce CompuCom as being on the top 100 list this year in the number six spot. Thanks so much for that, Ray. That brings us to number five. For that, let's turn things over once again to Rob Brown of HPE. Thank you, Jody. Since 2018, this year's number five top solution provider expanded its professional and managed services portfolio organically and via acquisition, adding more than 5,500 new employees and tripling in size. Today, the company has a broad range of offerings from cloud and application services to SAP services and digital workplaces, security and FinOps, as well as commercial software such as IT asset management, software sourcing, and software publisher advisory. This organization, which has also developed a vertical expertise in the construction, finance, government, and nonprofit sectors, recently unveiled a new brand identity and market positioning that reflects its transformation over the last five years. And what has happened in recent years? The company has evolved from a licensing reseller to a global software and cloud solutions provider that helps organizations unlock the value of technology. The fact that it has been able to do this at a time of churn and instability 
speaks volumes of the people who make up this fine organization. Our number five solution provider is the very picture of a company on the rise. With rock solid financials and Amazon Web Services premier tier services partner status now in its back pocket, the future looks very bright indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, our number five solution provider is Software One. Well, thanks, Rob, and congratulations to Software One. And now we're going to go back to Paul Barker of Channel Daily News, who will unveil our number four spot. Coming up, Paul. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, it will be a long time before we come to fully grasp, let alone accept, the impact and implications of the global crisis that began in early 2020. Uh, but one thing we do know from previous shocks is that certain organizations did gain an advantage. Uh, our number four solution provider for 2023 is one of those organizations. Uh, what can one say about a Canadian tech vendor that has been growing at a faster rate than both the Canadian tech industry as a whole and the national economy? 2022 was another record year for our number four top solution provider. This company has been doing so well, it eclipsed its 2021 performance by more than $100 million. And their 2021 performance was nothing to be sneezed at. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our number four is no stranger to the top 100 ranking. And here they are once more. Let's all celebrate the continued high performance of Compagen. Thanks so much, Paul. Okay. Again, we thank Compugen. And with that, we have only our top three to uncover for you folks. Jim Love, Chief Information Officer and Content Officer of IT World Canada, will now unveil our number three top solution provider. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Love, CIO of IT World Canada and Tech News Day in the United States. And these are the top tech, oh, sorry, I thought I was doing my podcast for a second, be in there. Thank you so much. I, I just want to take a second as between Fawn and I, um, we, we bought this company. Uh, how does a guy with 35 years in IT end up owning a, 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 a production company, a news company? Um, and we did it to tell the stories about Canada. We did it because we're both passionate about telling the stories about technology in this country. And I want every one of you to, to just feel that passion because that's, that's what keeps us driving us every day to do all kinds of things, to take hybrid events like this before the pandemic about, about I don't know, uh, two weeks before it, we had a big event. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you're all locked up. You can't do an event. We're, we're, we're a marketing company that, that publishes. That's what we do. And we're suddenly stuck. This crew, the same crew that's here today, turned around in two weeks and we had the first hybrid or virtual event that we, that we had in there. We've all had to bounce around. We've all had to transform. And bringing this together and celebrating this, you're responsible for $11 billion in the Canadian economy. And I celebrate you all tonight. Thank you very much. Now, the, their website encourages clients to be ambitious. You have what it takes to achieve your bold technology goals. That's on their website. And this company practices what it preaches. They've been named Microsoft's Canada Partner of the Year and Cisco's Canada SMB Partner of the Year for 2022. More recently named as one of Canada's 50 best managed IT companies, a highly successful integrator, global provider of IT hardware, software, and services solutions. They have operations in 19 countries and partnerships with 6,000 plus software and hardware manufacturers and publishers. Our number three solution provider, Microsoft's largest global partner, is no stranger to the top 100 ranking. They've been there for years, but this year they've moved up to number three. Congratulations to Insight Canada. Well, thanks, Jim, and a huge congratulations to the Insight team. And with that, we only have our top two to uncover. So we'd like John Camilleri, Vice President, Commercial Channels with HP, to now reveal the number two solutions provider. When we think of what makes for a successful organization in the digital age, 
the age of super high speed and instant communications, we invariably, inescapably come to the power of building strong partnerships. I suppose you can call our number two solution provider for 2023 a regular at the summit of the top 100. But this is not some cold, unblinking moneymaker. This is a well-rounded organization. In fact, it was recently included in the 2023 edition of Women Lead Here, an annual benchmark published by the Globe and Mail's Report on Business magazine, recognizing Canadian businesses with the greatest gender diversity in executive leadership. Then there's the bottom line. Obviously, our number two solution provider continues to be a highly successful performer. But would you like to know what really stands out about this organization? It's the recognition it gives so generously to its partners. This is a no king atop the mountain. This is a major player that knows how important its partners are to its success and calls attention to that fact every chance it gets. This company recently held its own awards show where it recognized and celebrated the contributions of its various technology partners to its success. This is a great company, a rock solid organization that continues to achieve, but never fails to give credit where it's due. What more can you ask of a leading light in this industry? For those of you who haven't guessed it yet, our number two solution provider for 2023 is SoftChoice. Congratulations, Soft Choice, and thank you for that, John. And a huge congratulations for everybody uh, who's still with us right now. <laughs> and now they say the moment you've all been waiting for, Rob Brown of HPE will do the honors of announcing our top solution provider of the year. Rob? Thank you, Jody. Like our number two, Soft Choice, our top solution provider for 2023 is another company that knows the power of partnership. At its own very recent Partner of the Year Awards, this fine organization singled out Cisco, HPE, Veeam, and SonicWall as its Partners of the Year, and also presented Ingram Micro, Climb, Channel Solutions, IT Mission, Cisco, and Lenovo with Distributor, Services, and Manufacturer Partner Awards. And as you will find with any great and successful organization, the admiration and recognition goes both ways. This year's top solution provider has also been consistently recognized from our industry's top data center vendors as their partner of the year. This year's number one designs, orchestrates, and manages customized services and solutions for organizations both big and small. And it knows while it's strong and highly capable in itself, it is even stronger working with other partner organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, we once again recognize as top solution provider in the channel, CDW Canada. All right, congratulations to CDW Canada and congratulations to all the companies that rank in this year's big list as well as their channel innovation winners. Talk about leadership. So even in challenging times like this, when we look at companies like yours, we know the channel is strong and will continue to be strong going forward. If you were a top 100 solutions provider, you'll be receiving a digital badge you can share on social media or on your website and in advertising. If you have a CIA award winner or one of the top five solution providers of the year and were not able to attend, your physical award should be arriving in the mail shortly for a small fee and I'll deliver it personally. <laughs> to all in-person attendees, thanks for coming out. To all virtual attendees, thanks for joining us from wherever you are this afternoon and expect a link to the benchmark report, which was so excellently delivered by Mary earlier, very soon. And thanks again. You know, there's really no way of adequately expressing our gratitude for our sponsors. Again, HP, HP Enterprise, VMware and Samsung, as well as our supporters, Canadian Channel Chiefs, yeah. that's us. Yeah and Ingram Micro Canada. We are grateful for your generosity and continued support. Thank you to our speakers and, uh, and who, who also, uh, and of course you, the audience, right? <laughs> also, how about a round of applause for the IT World Canada staff for enabling us to do what we're doing and providing a hybrid event today. The best team ever. Look for editorial stories from this event in various IT World Canada publications. 
or you can come back to this platform tomorrow and you'll be able to see articles and rewatch the whole thing all over again from the comfort of your own couch or desk. Uh, we invite you to attend IT World Canada's next conference, Digital Transformation and CIO Awards on May 24th and 25th. MapleSec Satellite Series is slated for June 21st. And of course, Top Women in Cybersecurity event is scheduled for June 26th. Nominations are still open for that, so get your voting hats on. You can register for these events on the platform or at itworld.com. Well, that just about does it, Mark. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we let you go, let's take one last moment to salute all this year's winners. I'm hearing more and more how partners are working together to support one another. IT World Canada and Channel Daily News, more than ever before, want to share and amplify your stories to continue to advocate for the amazing work you do within the technology sector in Canada, which Jim does a wonderful job telling stories about. I encourage you all to visit the Canadian Channel Chiefs Council, or C4, at channelchiefs.ca. If you haven't already, tweet a picture, a thought, anything you'd like to tweet out. Let's be smart about it though. Within reason. Don't forget to hashtag CIA Awards. And to our virtual audience, that's you out there, don't forget the snack bar sponsored by our good friend Sandy and Samsung. If you haven't already visited, you can choose from an Uber Eats gift card or make a donation to Food Banks Canada. Well, I think we're pretty much done. So live attendees, you can all head out to the terrace for some food and refreshments. And to our virtual audience, have a great night and see you all next time. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.